So, weather and climate, we are shifting gears. So now I'm not talking about organisms anymore. Weather and climate are this is similar I but think. fundamentally different things. Um, a lot of times they're sort of used interchangeably, and that's not right. Weather is short term condition. Weather is outside, it's beautiful, and it's sunny in its February. That's absurd. But you wouldn't assume that this is our typical February climate. <coughs> this is a perfect example of how weather and climate can not, not be referring to the same thing. We have gorgeous weather today, but this is not our climate. Climate is long-term weather patterns based on averages, understanding the variability, the statistical variability associated with those averages, and it tends to be measured over decades. So climate is long-term, weather is short-term. Day, today's weather, yesterday, this week's weather, this month's weather, that's weather. We have a weatherman, not a climate man, because that would be really boring. I mean, he would be like, hey, man, he was wrong. <laughs> 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 have a lot of time to with weather. No, actually, that's not fair. Historically, they have, the weathermen now, with their predictions, they're fantastic. The fact that they can get within like two degrees every day, I mean, that's uncanny. They really are fantastic. You know, when I was a kid, that was always good. Oh, those women that doesn't even know. Not anymore. <laughs> those guys are so good at their jobs. So climate tends to be characterized by variability over time. Climate tends to be characterized by extreme changes that can happen over time. But climate is also best reflected by averages. So here in Kansas, here in eastern Kansas, we have what's called an intercontinental climate, meaning that because we have a fairly high distance from the oceans, our climate patterns tend to be fixed by air movements that are either coming from the north down out of Canada, over the Rocky Mountains to the west, or up from the Gulf at different times of the year. But this intercontinental climate that we experience tends to be characterized by a few things. Um, we have distinct seasons. That's a characteristic of an intercontinental climate. We tend to have wetter and drier periods. We get three-fourths of our rainfall between April and September, and one-fourth over the rest of the, the time period of the year. And then another characteristic of our intercontinental climate is variability. Climate can be characterized by its variability, and Kansas has variable weather. And so, um, meaning that we can have extreme events, floods and droughts, we can have high temperatures, in the winter, we can have low temperatures sometimes in the summer. We can have a variable climate. Not all locations do, but we have an extremely variable climate as a byproduct of, of, of where we live. All right? So weather and climate. So some of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit today is climate basically is one of the most fundamental characteristics of the physical environment. And when we think about the tall grass prairie in particular, there's three main driving forces that structure this ecosystem. One is fire, two is the presence of large grazers, and three is our variable climate. So climate is, is viewed to be one of the main structuring forces of the tall grass prairie, one of the three. Climate, though, has big impacts on the geographic distributions of organisms. Where plants and animals live is a function of their climate. The amount of growth and the decomposition of plant growth is a function of, of the climate. The development of soils through a long period of time is a function of the climate. And then overall, our human health and well-being is impacted upon by the climate of the region in which you, you reside. Okay. One thing, though, that you don't tend to think about, though, is that organisms tend to have big impacts on climate. It's not basically a unidirectional process. Um, one of the ways in which organisms affect climate is by the creation of albedo. So plants basically change the amount of light that's actually reflected back up. So you have light energy coming in, and then you have light energy going back up. And that process of reflectance is called albedo. And plants basically are, are altering the reflectivity of the planet. So as a good example of this, if you go to a very arid system where there's low plant biomass, so imagine semi-arid or a desert environment, the albedo of that environment is going to be low. Most of the light energy that's coming in is being absorbed by the ground. Convert, that energy is converted from photons into heat energy, and it warms up. If you have an area of the environment that has a lot of plant layer, lots and lots of plant biomass, imagine either coast of our continent, imagine tropical conditions, a lot of that light energy that comes in is reflected off the plant leaves and back up into the atmosphere. It's a high albedo, and the temperature stays a little bit cooler. 
So plants impact, plants impact the environment by changes in albedo. Plants also impact changes in the environment based on transpiration and the recycling of, of water. So one thing that's kind of neat to think about is some plants actually produce these secondary metabolites in their leaves. So a, a secondary metabolite would be an organic compound that's being used that is not that is not used to make energy. It's not in any way used to form ATP. So a lot of plants, so for instance, if you go to Colorado and you know that sort of citrusy smell out of pine needles, well, that's a secondary metabolite. So it's a small organic molecule that's being leaked out of the leaves of the pine trees. Those molecules diffuse up. They form sort of complex hydrocarbons, and those complex hydrocarbons basically form um, aerosols up in the environment, which then form clouds to form, which then makes it rain. So this is a way that plants actually impact their environment. The same thing, the cornfields of western Kansas lose a lot of water out of their leaves, and as that water is transpired, clouds basically uh, start to basically form based on all of that transpiration and the water lost out of the leaves, and then it actually leads to a, a wetter microclimate. So plants actually recycle water, form clouds, and then cause it to rain again, or plants can exude molecules, which then form precipitates in the atmosphere, and then also cause it to rain. So plants impact their environment in many different ways. So plants can basically impact the climate. So if you have grass, let's say in the yard, Bermuda or other grasses that are shaded by trees, the major factor affecting them not doing very well is the salt heat. Is that a fair statement? Um, so if you have plants growing in your yard that are shaded, the main reason why they're not doing well is they're not getting enough energy in the form of sunlight. So albedo is reflected light, but in the case that you described, the, the grasses wouldn't be doing well because they're not getting light to actually be used for photosynthesis. Because when light strikes a leaf, it has three fates. It can be reflected, it can be absorbed, or it can be fluoresced. I'm not even going to talk about fluorescence because I've already bored the crap out of you guys with nerdy physiological things. But of the two different things, reflected and absorbed, reflected is albedo, absorbed is photosynthesis. So what you described is the grasses aren't doing very well because they're not getting light in the form of energy to do photosynthesis. They're being shaped. So reflecting and absorbing are two related but slightly different things. But that's why your, your grass is stinking up. It's not getting enough. Um, organisms, of course, affect atmospheric composition by the recycling of, of key, key elements, oxygen, methane, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide. Plant transpiration drives local and regional hydrological cycles. That's what I just talked about with cornfields or areas of highly, highly productive plants that are recycling a lot of water and impact local hydrological cycles for at least a short period of time. And then organic particles out as, act as cloud condensation nuclei, and that's a good example of those secondary metabolites that I was talking about that can leak out of, out of pine needles. Okay, so some key things that I, I want to talk about today is one of them I want to talk a little bit about the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is a process that warms our, warms our planet. It's very, very fundamentally important to biotic organisms on Earth. I want to talk a little bit about how the atmosphere alters the composition of solar inputs. And then um, we might get a little bit about into how solar inputs drive global climate patterns and, and wind and things like that. Um, we'll see how you guys are doing. I'll, I'll try and assess this by 11. And uh, you guys want me to keep going and go, otherwise we'll quit the <laughs> bus. So global climate patterns are driven by solar inputs. So, in the last talk with biological organisms, we were talking about energy. All the energy comes from the sun. That energy, basically, energy is lost every time it is either consumed by through a trophic chain, or even as energy is lost, it is converted from one type of molecule into another. Like when we talked about photosynthesis and respiration. But the solar inputs that are coming into Earth, basically, they pass through the atmosphere or are reflected by the atmosphere. They're either reflected by the Earth's surface or absorbed by the Earth's surface. And the same thing, they're either reflected or absorbed by the ocean. The Earth, though, is an open system, just like <coughs> ecosystems were an open system. So energy is coming in, but the energy that's coming in will ultimately be, be, ultimately be balanced by being lost back into the solar system. 
So it is an open system. That energy is not conserved within the Earth. All the energy that comes in from the sun is balanced by that same amount of energy being lost by the Earth back out in space. It's open. It's not being stored. Okay. The heating of the Earth's surface is not uniform, and that's because it's in kind of a sphere. It's a bit oblong. But the, the, the shape of the Earth and the tilt of the axis is such that we have uneven heating. So solar inputs into our system are not the same based on where you are. However, the solar inputs that come in are redistributed, redistrib the energy is redistributed across the Earth's system. Let's see if we get to that. The Earth does, though, act as a giant heat engine. And this is a byproduct of the greenhouse effect. So the energy that comes in can get redistributed and basically the Earth is warmer because of our atmosphere. The Earth is warmer than it would be if it didn't have an atmosphere. And that's a byproduct um, of the greenhouse effect. But the Earth acts as a heat engine and it redistributes and dissipates energy from the sun. But ultimately though, the key thing is, energy that's coming in ultimately does get re-radiated back out to space. There's no net gain. All the energy that comes in is lost. So if you're going to think about inputs and, um, and losses of energy out. So fundamental concept here, energy in equals energy out from the sun. The average annual solar input for a square meter is about 340 watts. So if you like went across basically the entirety of the Earth and then averaged, we're looking at about 340 watts per square meter. Half, so let me, let me I'm going to put up all this text, but then I'll walk through that. So we have incoming solar radiation. So we're basically, that 100, you can think of it as like 100%. So all of the incoming solar radiation that's coming in, we're just talking about short waves. So high energy wavelengths. Energy, light is, light is cool because light basically has the characteristics of both the particle and the wave. I mean, this is Einstein's theory. So it's coming in the form of a wave, but it's actually a particle, it's a photon. Your short waves, of course, are your high energy. Your long waves are your low energy. Very little of the long wave radiation that exists in the universe ever makes it to the surface. It's screened out by the atmosphere, so it doesn't make it in. But the short wave radiation does. Of that 100%, 17% of that is absorbed by water, dust, and ozone, and other things in the atmosphere. Some of it gets backscattered by air, 7%. Some of it, 16% of it gets backscattered by clouds or absorbed by clouds. But you're looking at somewhere between 23% gets absorbed by uh, uh, the Earth is absorbing of direct solar radiation. And you also have um, a big chunk of that that gets absorbed by diffuse sky radiation that's being re reflected. So about half, about half of the solar inputs of shortwave radiation are actually getting to the surface. So we already have a reduction of energy from where this, you know, emitted from the sun to actually hitting the Earth. There's a big reduction. A bunch of it gets lost. Now, the greenhouse effect, though, is a byproduct not of that shortwave radiation, but of this longwave radiation. Because every time that light gets reflected, the wavelength change, the wavelength of that light gets elongated. It goes from being short waves to long waves. There's a reduction of energy. And that long wave radiation is basically what bounces back up and gets absorbed by clouds or gets absorbed by higher up in the atmosphere. And that long wave radiation contributes to the creation of the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect is basically what has given rise to the diversity of life that exists on our planet. We have a warmer, more stable environment than we would have if we didn't have an atmosphere creating a greenhouse effect by the production of this long wave radiation. I know this is a little bit abstract to think about, but the greenhouse effect is a great thing. We wouldn't have life on our planet without it. And it's basically reinforced by long wave radiation. But the key thing that I want you to remember though, energy in equals energy out. All of the energy coming from the sun is ultimately lost back out to the solar system through the emittance of long wave radiation, which will eventually pass back through the atmosphere. So there's several different terms, though, that I want you to think about. When we think about plants on the landscape, plants basically deal with energy in, in many different forms. 
So you can have radiation that is directly absorbed by plants from the sun. So in this case, it would probably be shortwave radiation that falls within the window of energy that plants can use. Plants can use a very narrow range of light energy from wavelengths of 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, which just so happens to be the same wavelengths of light that we see. And that's a bit parsimonious that we see the same wavelengths that plants use. So they use red, green, and blue. Blue being short, red being long. So direct radiation used by plants. So this is one form of energy. You can have reflected light. So this would be backscattered. Each time it's reflected, that wavelength it, 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 it comes out a little bit longer. But as long as it's under 700, they can be used. But then that's light that's actually used to drive photosynthesis. There's other forms of energy though that are really important. One is convection. So I have convection drawn here with wind and the leaf surface. Anyone define convection for me? What's convection? It's a form of energy that's used. Um, this would be just blowing in a continuous cycle. Like, um, it's going down and it's cooling and it's moving back up. Yeah, so convection requires a moving air mass, just like you said. Convection also requires dissimilar temperatures. So the exchange of energy by convection would be when the leaf's temperature is different from the temperature of the air mass that's moving over it. So the leaf temperature might be cooler than the air, or the leaf temperature might be warmer than the air. But you have an exchange of energy based on a dissimilar temperature between a moving air mass and static function. In this case, it's a plant. You can have thermal radiation. Organisms produce heat. We're all sitting in here producing a lot of heat. Plants produce small amounts of heat. So you have sort of the thermal radiation based on a change in natural temperature. Plants re-radiate light. Just like that question earlier about absorbing light like based on changes in albedo versus direct sunlight. Plants re-radiate re re most of the light that hits them. So a lot of the light that hits plants bounces off the wax layer and is re-radiated. So you can re-radiate energy, can be bounced off of the ground. And then the last one that I haven't talked about here is transpiration. What's transpiration? Similar to evaporation, but what's the fundamental difference? It's, it's water loss through plant tissue, or is, yeah. that, is that right? So you can think of it as being evaporation from leaves. That's mm -hmm. a pretty easy one. But we're talking about energy. So how in the heck yeah. is this related to energy? Well, it's water that's changing. That's a fundamental energy process. But how? Stomata. <laughs> well, stomata are the mechanism on which yeah. water escapes through the pores and leaf surfaces. But how, but how is the how is transpiration linked to this idea of energy? Well, I mean, it would take energy to make the water go out, and that takes energy out. Water moves by diffusion, which by definition doesn't require energy. But that was a really good guess. <laughs> <laughs> carbon dioxide mostly comes in, it can get respired, but that would be at a small amount, and again, carbon dioxide moves by diffusion. What happens when you sweat? Why do you sweat? Right? Does, it, does the water as leaves take heat energy with it? Yes! So, <laughs> there's two main types of heat exchange. One's called sensitive heat, and it's just a change in temperature, the energy required to change temperatures and make molecules move faster or, or, or slow down. And then the other one, so that's sensible heat. The other's latent heat. And latent heat is the energy that's required for a phase change. So in transpiration, you were going from liquid water, liquid, liquid, it's not just that, liquid, 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 into the leaves, and then it gets into the leaves, there's a phase change to vapor. And that's a whole other lecture. And I've already, like, you're already on the cusp of, like, being able to tolerate me any longer with this. But when that phase change happens, it requires energy. It takes energy to change phase. And as a byproduct of the energy that's required to change phase, it actually serves basically to lower the temperature a little bit. And that lowering of the temperature is why when you sweat, it helps to cool you down. It's associated with phase change. There's a phase change as water goes from liquid to gas. And that process absorbs energy and buffers the temperature a little bit. Okay, a phase change in the fall, you have in the spring, you have trees and leaves. In the fall, those leaves turn brown and die. Mm -hmm. Is that 
transpiration? No. That's transpiration okay. is the continual process of losing water when the creep that when the leaves are are green and active. In the fall when leaves senesce, um, water gets conserved in the stem. So as the leaves senesce in the fall, what the plants do is they take all of the usable sugars that were still in there and then pull them back into the plant to store. They take the nutrients that can be mobilized, so any nutrients that can be broken down into simpler forms and stored or sucked out and back into the plant, like nitrogen. Nitrogen is a real commodity, so plants try and save it, so they pull it back in. And that's basically, they take all of the, the usable components out of the leaf, what you're left with, and that includes some of the water and the nutrients and things and the sugars. And as they pull it back in, you're just left with everything they couldn't salvage. The, you know, the more complex carbohydrates, the nutrients that couldn't be mobilized. But there's no real water loss associated with senescence. And transpiration is the water loss. It's a byproduct of having to photosynthesize it. You can have transpiration occurring without a moving air mass. Some plants have their stomata in what's called a stomatal crypt. So on the leaf surface, there's like a big, you can think of it as like a valley or a depression. And at the bottom of that depression is where that pore would be. And there's absolutely no air mass that's going down into these little depressions on the leaf surface. So convection is playing no role at all because convection requires a moving air mass at a different temperature. Okay. So you can't have transpiration without convection. What did you but on a really windy day, mm -hmm. transpiration rates can be very high. Think about a July day out here on the prairie when you've got high temperatures, you've got fairly low humidity, and you've got a lot of moving air mass plants dry out. You water your grass in the morning by the sure. afternoon. You know, you, if you're wearing like um, those polarized glasses, you can see that the grass is like starting to curl and be a different color. And that's because the byproduct of a high vapor pressure deficit, so water wants to move out right. of the plants, plus the wind moving it away with a lot of convection, that warm air, it you know, moves a lot of water. Really fast. Okay. So there can be, it, convection can be important for transpiration. Right. What did you call the stomata that were kind of hidden or? They're, it's called a crypt. A you crypt. Know? Cryptic. Most of the times, biologists come up with terrible terms. Yeah. <laughs> what the heck? Yeah. Like, how did you come up with that? Uh -huh. That's stupid. But that's a really good one. It's a yeah. model crypt. Yeah. <laughs> Indiana Jones. Okay. So, the greenhouse effect. So, you hear a lot about the greenhouse effect. Oh, the greenhouse effect is terrible. No, the greenhouse effect is what supports life on Earth. The greenhouse effect has been here since the blue-green algae basically created an atmosphere for the planet. The greenhouse effect is what warms the planet. The warming of that planet is based on that reflection and, and absorption of long-wave radiation. So long-wave radiation is re-reflected and then it's absorbed by the ozone of the atmosphere. And the absorption of that long-wave radiation basically creates heat. In general, the greenhouse effects keeps the greenhouse effect keeps the Earth around 33 degrees Celsius. That's sort of the global, global temperature. Or 33 degrees Celsius warmer than it would be if the planet didn't have an atmosphere at all. So the greenhouse effect is playing a major fundamental role in the warming and the ability of living organisms to colonize the planet. Or maybe close to 27. Um, there are several different gases that contribute to the, the warming potential of the greenhouse effect. It's not a static thing. It can change based on the gases that exist in the atmosphere because these molecules are what absorbs this long wave radiation. The, that's why carbon dioxide is important. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So you can think of this list as being our greenhouse gases. So these are the molecules absorbing that long wave radiation. Water is an important greenhouse <coughs> gas. Methane, nitrous oxide, this is lacking gas. There's a lot of nitrous oxide. In and then, of course, ozone is an important greenhouse gas. Um, the figures that I have over here, um, I have the energy potential associated on this up and down y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we have um, the, the, the outgoing radiation. So a short wave or short wavelengths of light coming from the sun basically have huge energy potential, but they're, they're very short wavelengths. Then when we get in our infrared region and the wavelengths get longer and longer, the amount of energy associated with them goes down, but you can see that they're much longer wavelengths. They cover much bigger periods of time. Each time they're reflected up and down and up and down, they get longer and longer and longer and longer. 
So this idea of a greenhouse effect on the planet has been around a long time. So uh, this physicist, Arrhenius, is the one who first coined this term, a greenhouse effect. And he's the one who basically described how molecules in the atmosphere basically can absorb energy, and as the process of absorbing that energy, impact the temperature of the planet. Um, all of these greenhouse gases, though, don't have the same warming potential. So the one we talk about the most is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide concentrations in our atmosphere have been increasing. So we have, you know, a year here on the bottom, so a thousand years AD to uh, the end of our last century, 2000 AD. You can look at carbon dioxide changes through time and then it's spiked. Here's nitrous down here, so changes in nitrous over the last thousand years over time when it's went up and then we have methane over there. On, on each of these panels though, I have GWP and then I have values. Anyone have a guess at what GWP stands for? It stands for Global Warming Potential. And this is a relativized term such that carbon dioxide is given a value of one. So the global warming potential of carbon dioxide means how effective is this gas as serving as a warming agent? Like how much of long wave radiation can it absorb and then change the temperature? And so it's given one, meaning that it's fairly poor. It's a fairly poor greenhouse gas. But then when we look at some of the other ones that are going up in our, in our atmosphere, methane, has a global warming potential of 23, meaning it has the potential, a warming potential that's 23 times greater than carbon dioxide. Global warming potential. So it's more, the release of methane can have huge impacts on the warming potential of the atmosphere. The same for nitrous. So it has a global warming potential of 300, it's 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. The concentrations though are really different. So CO2 over here, we're currently around 410 parts per million by volume. So, you know, if you had a million molecules, um, 400 of them would be carbon dioxide. When we get down here to N2O, nitrous, and methane, it's PPB, parts per billion. So concentrations of this are really low, but it's really important. It has an over 300 times more effective warming potential than carbon dioxide. But in our environment, they have different concentrations. Is that based on per molecule? In other words, one molecule of methane, 23 times one molecule of carbon dioxide? Yes. Exactly. Thanks for making that more clear. Anyone else? OK, so the effects of our, our atmosphere is pretty important. and has big impacts in terms of its ability to uh, impact the radiation that's striking the Earth. So most all of the UV radiation tends to be absorbed by stratospheric ozone. This is the layer of our atmosphere that's the highest up. This is really important. So infrared is the shortest wavelengths of light, so we can't see any infrared. We just see the visible spectrum. You've got UV, visible spectrum, and then you've got infrared. And uh, the UV, thank goodness, gets absorbed by our stratospheric ozone. If it didn't, we'd have a hard time going outside like not wrapped in like aluminum foil to try and keep it off our skin or we'd all be cooked and have skin cancer. UV is the, is the light energy that is not good for living organisms. But luckily, most all of it gets reflected out by the stratosphere that goes on there. The visible, the visible light, the light we see that comes in does tend to about 25 to 50% of it um, tends to get absorbed by the atmosphere. And then infrared, the longer wavelengths, we can't see infrared either, but it's longer, less energy than the visible spectrum. It also tends to be reduced. So the atmosphere is absorbing and reflecting a lot of the light. Of the radiation that makes it to the Earth, half of it's infrared, about half of it's so PAR, that's visible spectrum, that's light we see. That PAR stands for photosynthetically active radiation. It just think visible. It's like what we're seeing, and that's what plants use too. And then a very small portion, 5%, maybe even a little lower, depends on where you are on the planet, tends to be UV. If you're on the poles, UV light tends to be a little higher. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it tends to be a little higher than in the northern hemisphere. Is that totally coincidental that we see the same thing? No. It is amazing, isn't it? The of evolution in the I have no idea, but it is something that's quite striking. That plants are using the exact same light that we actually see. Because the range of wavelengths of light is huge. 
and the, yeah. the wavelengths that we see is this narrow little band, and it's the same narrow little band that comes from. But it must be coincidental, right? Because other organisms or animals see yeah. very different parts yeah. of the spectrum of light. So, for instance, so most, of our, see UV, for most of our pollinators, a lot of our pollinators are functioning in UV. So bees see in UV. So the colors that bees see on flowers are completely different than the colors that we see. And as an example of this, ooh, we are getting way off top of the fence there. Sorry. Uh, as, uh, <laughs> when bees go to pollinate, a good example would be, um, um, oh shoot. Sunflowers. Yes, sunflowers. That's um, Rebecca. Rebecca, uh, black-eyed Susan. Black-eyed Susans. Yeah. Have this beautiful, if you look at a black-eyed Susan under ultraviolet light, they have a beautiful bullseye pattern. I mean, yeah. it's fantastic. So around the periphery of the leaves in, the, the, in the, the, the petals, there's a band of one color followed by a distinctly new band of color. It looks like a dartboard. It's this perfect concentric rings into the center portion of the flower. And that's what a bee sees. We just see a beautiful yellow leaf flower with a black center. And that's not what bees see at all. And that's because they're seen in a different portion of the spectrum. And plants have evolved through time to attract bees using color. It's just not the colors that we see. And that is in no way related to climate. Okay. <laughs> so uh, to go through really fast through the atmosphere. So the stratosphere is the layer of the atmosphere that we interact with the most. Basically, you can think of the stratosphere as being the, the area that's closest to the Earth's surface. On this little diagram I have down here, it has Mount Everest drawn, and Mount Everest is about a third of the way through the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is the portion of the atmosphere that we're interacting with. The, but this, this, um, this picture, one of the things that, it wanted, that I, wanted to, I wanted to make clear is that the temperature of the atmosphere changes as you increase ice carbon. Uh, and this is partially a function of the absorption of these gases, the greenhouse gas effect. We do have an inversion layer, so as you're increasing in, in, in altitude, um, you will start to have cooler and cooler temperatures, and that's just a byproduct of changes in pressure of the atmosphere. So as that pressure changes, you have a change in air temperature. But then you go through this inversion layer, and as you go through that inversion layer from between the troposphere and the stratosphere, um, uh, that is a byproduct of differential absorption of uh, radiation like gases. And so you start to have this change in the temperature. <coughs> okay, so trying to figure out how much of this we should do. I want to go a little bit into how biomes are formed as a function of, um, uh, of air currents and movement of air masses, and then I think we'll wrap it up. And then I I have one other little thing that I want to show you. And then we'll, let's take a short break and go outside. So one of the key things that impacts um, biomes and ecosystems is climate. And the climate of the planet is not uniform. And it's not uniform because you have non-uniform heating. And one of the reasons why you don't have uniform heating of the planet is because the Earth's surface is curved. And based on that curvature of the Earth, um, that really dictates uh, biome distribution to a certain extent. I already talked about the Earth as a heat engine that's redistributing heat that's collected from the sun. That redistribution basically is 60% by air movements and 40% by the oceans. Our oceans serve a fundamentally important role in the climate uh, of, of all of the biomes on Earth. So the oceans are really dictating and playing a very important role on redistributing heat and rain, which dictates the climate. So if we think about our sort of curved Earth and radiation that is striking it, the region of the Earth that is closest to the sun, so somewhere within the tropics, whether it's the equator or anywhere between the zone of the tropics, from the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn, um, that sort of, at any given point in time, it's the closest to the sun, and as a byproduct of that, and that angle of incidence, it's the warmth. It's receiving the most, or the greatest amount, of energy inputs. Regions that are the farthest away from the sun at any given point in time, of course, are receiving the lowest amount of energy inputs, tend to be the coolest. And this varies, of course, as a function of 
which season you're in. So in this case that we have drawn here, the southern hemisphere would be the furthest away. They would be in winter, both, at, both as a consequence of angle of incidence from being the furthest away right here, but also because of the tilt of the Earth, they're out of season. Be the lowest amount of, of energy that's coming in as a byproduct of the curvature of the planet, as well as that 22 and a half degree tilt. So, adiabatic cooling and heating. So this is a process that refers to how changes in pressure ultimately impacts temperature. And the change in pressure and temperature is sort of related to this compression and expansion of gases. And this is important. I'll show it in one of those next slides. Is we look at how water basically is produced and temperature changes in the intertropical convergence zone. So rising air expands. So as air rises, the molecules move out. As the molecules move out, the temperature goes down. So molecules that are, are compressed, basically as the closer they get, the temperature would increase. But as you lower the atmospheric pressure and molecules spread out, they inherently cool. And they inherently cool as a function of adiabatic cooling. That's what that, that term basically is referring to. Descending air, so descending air masses that are coming down go from being spread out to being more compressed, and as that product, as a byproduct of that, the temperature increases as the molecules become more and more compressed in actual physical space. Heat is produced. And so this is the process of adiabatic cooling and heating through this compression or expansion of air masses. So pressure, in this case, you could think of it as dictating temperature. That rate of temperature change is about 5 to 10 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 meters that you increase in altitude. It also sort of, you can test a similar principle as you change latitudes on the planet. You can also have similar changes in temperature um, for slightly different reasons, but it's also similar. You can have this be a dry adiabatic lapse rate, so associated pressure temperature relationships independent of vapor. But in moist environments, that change in temperature that is associated with um, changes in elevation is lower. And it's lower because of that latent heat of condensation. This is something we talked about just a few minutes ago. What's latent heat of condensation or, or latent energy exchange? Transportation, so the recycling of water. So in, in areas that are moist, the energy that's associated that is required for a phase change actually lowers that rate of temperature change as you go up in elevation of rate. So water can provide an important buffer for some of these processes. One of the, the main uh, ideas, though, is cool air holds less water vapor. So in winter time, because the air is cool, it carries a lot less moisture than the air can carry in the summertime. And that's just a function of this relationship between pressure and temperature. So as the temperature gets lower, it can just hold, even with being roughly the same pressure, it can basically carry this forward. Okay, so how biomes are distributed across the planet, I said, is a function of two things, air movements as well as recycling by the ocean. So the biomes and the distribution of biomes on our planet basically can be thought of based on incoming radiation and the movement of air masses that dictate where that energy goes because I said the Earth is kind of like a heat engine and it's dissipating this energy across the planet. So a lot of the energy that comes in, the majority of the energy would be absorbed here in the tropics. So at the equator and then at, at the, uh, at wherever, as, the, as we go through our seasonal cycle, wherever the sunlight is in its um, uh, most closest uh, zenith to the, to the planet. And so as that energy is coming in, that energy would be absorbed by vegetation here in this wet tropical zone. A lot of that energy is re-radiated by leaves, so that process of albedo that we talked about a little bit ago. And some of that energy that's absorbed is used to drive this phase change of water from liquid to vapor, and then that vapor gets recycled. So that water that comes in here that strikes the planet and sets up what's called an intertropical convergence zone. And that's just the, heat, the energy that's coming in is actually the rocket it produces a rising air mass. And so then that air, that energy is used to push air up. And as air is pushed up, remember, it starts to cool. And as that process of cooling happens, as the air is pushed up, it starts to form clouds. 
So here on the equator, you look at it, the equator running through the northern portion of South America there. That dashed line is an approximation of where the intercontinental convergence zone would be. And you can see uh, a distinct band of clouds. This zone, based on where it is, the intertropical convergence zone shifts as a function of day of the year. So um, based on whether you're an equinox or not. And so that zone, though, this cloud formation tends to go up and down within the tropics over the course of the year. But it's a function of that energy being used to push air up. So when you think about, go back to this, this period here, air is being pushed up out of the tropics. And in the southern hemisphere, it will start to circulate down. In the northern hemisphere, it will circulate up. As a byproduct of this circulation, you have a shift in this intertropical convergence zone. You have these warm air masses moving up. As they move up, they cool. As they start to move over the planet, they start, they start to have condensation events, and they start to rain out. Any vapor that was in that air mass as it moved up starts to rain out. And then eventually, it gets, that air gets heavy. And then as that air gets heavy, it starts to fall back down to the surface. And that process of falling back down to the surface, as it moves back down, and it starts to compress and the pressure gets builder, gets higher, what happens to air masses as they get condensed? What happens to temperature? It warms. And so in this process here, you have rising, cooling air, matter, air masses out of the tropics, then you have falling air masses that warm at roughly 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator. What is the characteristic of or terrestrial biomes that fall at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Deserts. That's where most deserts fall on the planet. And it's a byproduct of these air masses that are falling down. So these subtropical high pressures as they come down, there's very little vapor left. Most of it's rained out. And those warm air masses are coming down. So you have warm air hitting the land surface, and it's not carrying very much moisture. And that's what actually ends up forming these hot deserts. Then as that air mass moves across, across the surface of the Earth, eventually it will start to rise again. It will start to rise again, and it will come back up at around 60 degrees south and 60 degrees north, and that rising air mass will go back up. The air masses that are moving across the ocean will start to pick up moisture again as they move across the ocean. And then as they move across, you'll start to see more music or more um, Know, the, the world's forest, a lot of the world's forest in the form of 60 degrees south and 60 degrees north. So you start to have these zones of tropical forests, arid regions, and then uh, the more temperate, more temperate sort of ecosystems. Then the last thing is, is that same process that formed the hot deserts here, this process of air, mass, air masses coming out of the tropics, rising, raining out, and then ultimately Drop condensing and dropping back down with warm air. The same thing happens in the poles, only it's not warm air there. It tends to be cold air as a function of the polar regions, but our polar regions also can be think of, be thought of as cold deserts. They get very little rainfall in there, they just tend to be cold. But it's the same sort of phenomenon that produces the hot deserts that produces the cold deserts. It's just a function of where they are on the planet instead of being hot deserts or cold deserts. But they get very little rainfall. You can use this same principle to think about how winds form. So this rising of air masses and falling of air masses and the change in pressure is what actually sets up wind. So as you go from regions of, of uh, high pressure to low measure pressure, down that pressure gradient of high to low is what actually causes winds to start to form. And the winds actually move through these cells of, of rising and, and, um, and, and decreasing air, matter, air masses. Keep saying matters. They're massive, and so that's what um, is causing the winds to form. The type of winds and the direction of wind flow, though, is impacted by things such as the landscape of the surface, so if it's over a terrestrial landmass, and the movement around these different cells. But it gets at this idea of these circulation patterns. The distribution of how air masses rise and flow as a function of energy inputs predominantly hitting at the equator is what sets up some of the Earth's waves and driest regions. So a lot of our deserts um, it, you know, go through 30 degrees south as well as 30 degrees north. You know, most of our desert ecosystems fall within that range. There are other things that can contribute to the formation of deserts and desertification, but just climate by itself plays a big role in determining the desert. The distribution of deserts 
and or not the, distri <laughs> the distribution of circulation patterns and air masses and precipitation plays a big role in the formation of soil. So a lot of the different types of soil classes that exist on the planet are also influenced by changes in climate, as are the major biomes of the planet. So when we were talking about uh, temperate ecosystems, tropical ecosystems, and then polar regions. So biomes are heavily influenced by climate. So, a couple more slides. I'll say one thing on climate change, and then let's call it a day. So one of the things, so we have seasonality, because we live in a temperate region of North America. So by temperate, I mean we're not in the polar region, we're not in the tropics, we're in the temperate zone. We're above 23 degrees north. So we have climatic seasonality, and that is a function of the movement of the solar equator. So the solar equator would be a zone within the region of the tropics and where the sun is directly overhead at any given day. So, and the fact that we also have seasonality as a function of our tilting axis. <coughs> So the tilt that the Earth has right here, in, that's what creates our winter and our summer. And as a byproduct of that, um, where the sun is actually striking the Earth within that zone of the tropics sets up, um, uh, basically you can think of it as this idea of the solar equator that we have here. So this term solar equator is referring to where the sun would be directly head, overhead on any given day. And that the region is the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn. Um, oh, I had it down here. So any, any time, wherever it's directly over our head would be the solar equator. Um, the movement of that intertropical convergence zone is set up by this change in the tropical equator. And you remember that's the zone where that the low pressure area where the air mass is going to start to rise. And as it rises up, and it takes that moisture with it. And that moisture with it then is redistributed across the, the Earth's surface. And then there are several different things that influence climate. So mountain ranges, vegetation type, et cetera. I'm going to skip over some of this. I want to do one last thing. So in the US, here in the central portion of the US, we have a distinct climate zone, in both in terms of precipitation and temperature. So in terms of mean annual precipitation, we go from a more mesic to a more semi arid as we go from east to west. Ponds, of course, lies right here in the almost the boundary of this mesic ecosystem type. But then climatically, we have this distinct north south temperature gradient, which is a function of distance from the tropics. So the central Great Plains of the United States is an interesting ecoregion because we have a really distinct north south temperature gradient and a really distinct east west precipitation gradient. This gradient of climate is really what contributes to the types of grasslands that exist. Whether we've got tall grass prairie here, or we've got short grass step out you know, near Fort Collins, Colorado, or we've got semi-arid grasslands down here by Elko. And so it's this distribution of climate in terms of this axis of temperature and precipitation which sets up all of our grassland environments in the Central US. I'm going to skip over that. The last things that I want to talk about is a little bit that carbon dioxide, I talked about at the beginning that it's a greenhouse gas. It varies naturally through time. So if you ever hear people say CO2 varies naturally through time, they're correct, it does. CO2 has varied. This axis, this one over here, shows changes in carbon dioxide concentrations over the last several hundred thousand years. So this one just goes to 400,000 years before present. We've now extended that back past a million. So this is a little bit out of date. We know the rough carbon dioxide concentration of our atmosphere now going back over a million years. That's pretty cool. This is not a model. This is measured. And this is what's done by taking ice cores out of Greenland, dissolving the cores, capturing the gas, and measuring the carbon dioxide concentration of that gas. Ice cores are like tree rings. They're locking the information. We're past a million years of measured data. That's pretty awesome. So this shows that cycling through time. Carbon dioxide has changed over the century. So the year 2000 to the year 1000 changes. Carbon dioxide concentrations change within a given year. So you can see this up and down sawtooth pattern. So what's driving this? So what drives this change in carbon dioxide concentration that goes back over the last million years? What's causing it to rise and fall? 
ice age is. So ice ages cause this. So as we go into an ice age, more of the carbon dioxide gets locked up into the ocean. And as it does, it gets locked up down in the oceans during the, the zenith of an ice age when the Earth's at its coldest temperature. As the Earth comes back out of an ice age, that carbon dioxide is released from the oceans back into the atmosphere. It accentuates the greenhouse effect when the planet warms. Then we go back into an ice age, and out of an ice age, back into an ice age, out of an ice age. The Earth naturally has ice ages. Well, what drives ice ages? You don't know. There's three new things. You're super pumped if anyone gets one. CO2. It's, it it's changes in CO2 are a byproduct of an ice age. That's the byproduct. Okay. One is the tilt of the Earth is imperfect. It's not always 23 and a half. Sort of can fall through time. Slight changes in the, in the tilt of the Earth influence the, an ice age. The orbit of the Earth around the sun is also imperfect. It's not always the same distance around the sun that we travel within any given year. We start to have lengthening of that. There's a sort of, uh, it's a, that, that ellipse, shape of that ellipse can change through time. So that's two. Does anyone know what the third one is? There's a slight change in the tilt. There's the slight change in the, in the orbit. Anything else? Global air currents? No, it's a good guess. The wobble. There's a wobble associated with our daily cycle. So the, the spin of the Earth on its axis can tend to form these wobbles, and those wobbles actually contribute to the formation of ice ages. So the Earth has naturally had these ice ages, and then carbon dioxide has changed through time, and then here we get to where we are now. And so now we're going through this process where CO2 concentrations are higher than they've been. In several hundred million years. So, would you say that uh, those functions that are occurring to the Earth are a major factor as compared to the people that are saying we have a greenhouse effect that is, needs to be corrected by less uh, carbon, carbon products used and we'll end up with, with a downturn in this in the future? So the, the, the question was okay. Right now, you've got a lot of people saying, environmentalists saying, that we are in trouble because there's too much carbon being used in affecting the atmosphere, and causing a greenhouse effect, which is bringing that line clear up. The uh, greenhouse effect didn't bring this line up. Changes in carbon dioxide have carbon dioxide. accentuated the greenhouse effect and created a warming of our environment. You can look at this right here. So. Current, this has it drawn at a CO2 concentration of 360. We're at 410 right now. We're up here now. So if you look back over the last 400,000 years, and I just told you we've got documented evidence to a million years, and we are higher than we've ever been in a steeper rate of increase than has ever happened on our planet, well, it's pretty it, darn good evidence. Why is it caused by the wilding effects and all those other things? Because those on. things take hundreds of thousands of years to actually happen. So as we went into and out of ice ages, we are talking about the change of time for each one of these. It was an order on a magnitude of 50 to 70 to 100,000 years. We've done this in 100. That is a big difference in time. So what's what's not what? Why couldn't it do the other way in 100 years? Because geologists and people who aren't biologists actually can measure things with certainty because biological organisms are variable. Me and I look a lot alike. We're both fairly, I believe we're both descendants of Europe. You know, we're fairly similar and we act totally different. Biological organisms are variable. The earth is not variable. Geologists, atmospheric scientists can predict with certainty how things happen. We know exactly how the wobble happens. We know exactly how the ellipse around the sun and our solar system happens. All of this can be predicted with precision. He might do something, I might do this, this something else. We're of the same friggin' species. We have the very similar genotypes, and yet we act different. The Earth doesn't act different. You can predict this with certainty. And so that's how I know, and that we know, that the rate of change that we're going through now is not a naturally occurring phenomenon. Based on, would you say that we shouldn't actually, actually be heading into a ice age? So that's its own speculation. So ice ages happen with frequency around 40,000, 100,000 every 200,000 years, and it dictates the amplitude of the effect. So based on where we are in this periodicity, you know, getting up here to the top, 
potentially we could have started that long process back into an ice age again. However, just based on that length of time alone is not enough to predict whether or not an ice age would occur. But if anything, there, there should be, based on geological principles, we should be, there should be a greater chance of us cooling right now based on where we are in this history of ice ages rather than warming. So if anything, we're headed in the wrong direction than what, than what the wobble, the ellipse, and the tilt of the Earth would suggest. So the last one though that I didn't talk about is this one over here. Why does carbon dioxide go up and down by 20, you know, 15 parts per million? <coughs> so a lot of this, this data comes from Mauna Loa in Hawaii. So that's in the northern hemisphere. So what's causing this to go up and down on a yearly basis in Hawaii? What? Volcanoes. No, volcanoes. <laughs> <laughs> and you plant growth in so summers in the northern winters. hemisphere. So carbon dioxide would be at its lowest point in the summer in Hawaii. Would be at its highest point in the winter in Hawaii. Then it goes back down in the summer, back up in the winter, back down in the summer, back up in the winter. Any ideas? Plants. The sea. Plants taking carbon dioxide the out of the environment the when they're growing in the summer and pulling down. Plants actually are pulling down the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as they lock it into their biomass. And then right now they're a dormant community and it's being respired out and it goes back up. And the next summer they'll suck it back down and then it will kind of go back up. So that's essentially the, the influence of plants on our environment. They put this weather station on Hawaii so that it wasn't getting regional impacts. It's mostly just getting, you know, it's, uh, they tried to get it far away from, from land masses. But that's what you're actually seeing. You're seeing basically the, the role that plants play in dictating carbon dioxide in our environment in this up and down sea cycle. So I, I know it's too nice. We need to be done. I just want to show you one last thing. Uh, so it's the middle of February, and I talked to Jill about giving this. We're not going to be able to go outside. It's going to be 10 degrees below zero. We're not going to be able to do anything. So I made a whole big activity, and we're not going to do it. Um, <laughs> I want to show you something. So this is the National Climate Change Assessment Report. This came out two years ago. It was essentially a concerted effort by something like 500 atmospheric scientists from the United States and from other regions. And one of the best things that they did about this is it's very understandable and it's free to the public. It's the National Climate Change Assessment Report. But one of the things that I think is great is you can look at predictions for different regions. So on the left-hand side it has highlights and they tend to distill the information down just into the most usable bits. And then they have the full boring report or like that I would, I went to full report. But for the most part, the highlights part, part is just fine. But here in the highlights part, you can come over here and like hit explore. And one of the things that I think is super cool is you can pick different regions, explore regions, and then so like we can come over here to the Great Plains. Yes. And it gives you really specific forecasts for the Great Plains of the United States about how climate change is affecting the Great Plains. This isn't sensationalized. This is apolitical. This is just produced by atmospheric scientists. This, and it's not produced by atmospheric scientists that somehow are linked to Obama or anything else. This is just atmospheric scientists at the universities throughout the United States. They got the best ones together. There's over 500 of them. They spent like two years producing this. And they made it in a fashion that you can like understand. And they've got like all of these nice graphs. They've got useful information. Them, how it's impacting agriculture, how it's impacting ecosystems, how it's impacting human health, how it impacts water. So anyway, I would encourage you sometime to take a look at it because they did a really nice job in terms of trying to convey the effects of climate change for on a region by region basis. What's no what's not unknown? They're very honest about their uncertainty with associated with some predictions. And they did a nice job of actually sort of producing something that everybody can learn a little bit. When was this released? 2014. In the fall of 2014. So it's about a year and a couple months. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Is there a URL for that or a yeah. agency? Yeah. National Climate Change. I, 
when I found it, I just typed National Climate Change Assessment Report in Google's tool. Okay. But you can also, I think it's just nca2014.globalchange.gov. Yep, that's it. NCA82. Okay, so I've killed most of our time, but maybe a quick break and then we can. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jesse.